welcome to the Crossing Borders podcast. I'm your host, Julie White. On this show, my guests and I share information to help foreign trained health providers find their way into meaningful careers in the Canadian healthcare system. Let's get started. Welcome back, everyone. We are thrilled to have an exciting guest with us today, um, one that I think is going to uh, really resonate with a lot of folks, particularly those with a dental surgery background um, who are really looking at administrative types of roles and really interesting administrative roles. So my special guest today is Amod Budraja. And Amode is working with the County of Frontenac right now. Um, I know that sounds a little bit off or, or strange, perhaps, <laughs> um, for, some, for some folks that uh, may not be aware that counties actually provide a lot of health care services. So welcome, Amode. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me today. How are you? I'm fantastic. I am so pleased that you've been able to join us. I am glad as well. It's been nice to connect with you all over again after the course has ended. Yes, and it hasn't been that long um, since you graduated. You came in January 2022. Yes, I arrived in Canada in February 2022 because of part of the restrictions which were going during the pandemic. It was actually like in between the pandemic as when we were easing into the as you were easing into the restrictions of the whole pandemic. That's when I arrived in this country. All right. So we are going to um, get into our rapid fire question. All right. So this is going to warm you up. It's going to warm up our audience to a little bit of who you are and hopefully not give any of those Internet bots, you know, any insights into what your passwords might be. Uh, (laughs) So we're not asking any of those questions. Um, So first, what's your go to guilty pleasure? Shawarma. That's a good one. Um, Theme parks or camping? Team Fox. LinkedIn, Instagram, WhatsApp, or Snapchat? LinkedIn for professional, WhatsApp for personal. Apple TV, Disney Plus, Netflix, or YouTube? Netflix all the way. Anything you're watching right now? I am currently watching a series called Dr. House. I have watched it a couple of times already, but it's just one of my favorite uh, TV series. I just am rewatching it again. I love that. Yes. All right. Um, dogs or cats? Dogs. Favorite sport? Cricket. Do you have a favorite team? India. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Tim Hortons or Starbucks? Ooh, Starbucks. What's the most Canadian thing that you've done? Uh, had French vanilla with a Boston cream donut. I think so. Was that from Starbucks? No, that was from Tim Hortons. Oh, there you go. Even more Canadian. Yes. Um, early bird or <laughs> night owl? Night owl. On a deserted island, you can bring two things. What do you do? What do you bring? Food and my phone. As long as you have internet service, right? Yes. Exactly. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so you survived the rapid fire section. How's that? How did I do? It went well, in my opinion. <laughs> I think you did a great job. I think you did a great job. Perfect. All right. So let's move into a little bit about learning more about you. So can you talk to me about Little Limode, where you grew up and kind of your, what are the early influences in your career trajectory? So what I can tell you about myself is, and the audience as well is, I have been through different parts of my own country in India as I grew up. I have never played in a certain city for more than three or four years at a stretch. Because part of the reason was my dad had a transferable job. So we kept hopping from city to city as I was growing growing up. And I have been to boarding school. I have been to hill stations. I've been to the most hot places in the country, basically everywhere. I've been to places where I couldn't even speak the language they had as a mother tongue. But I managed through, I pushed through, and I learned new cultures. And that's made me the person who I am right now. Excellent. So... Um, when you're, when you're thinking about that and, and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, that must've given you so many 
I'm going to use the word transferable skills simply because, you know, that's part of what it is. But certainly you learned a lot about adaptation and, and kind of who you were, didn't you? Yes, adaptation is one of the key factors because every time you go to a new place, even if it's geographically new or culturally new, it really requires a lot of adaptation, a lot of, I would say, initiation from your end. You can't expect your surroundings to adjust according to your, uh, I would say, needs. You have to adjust depending upon the environment you're surrounded with and maybe change it a little bit because there are some things you can't change in life. and adapt new skills so that you can well settle. Okay. And how many languages do you speak? Apart from English, I would say I know three regional languages of India. Okay. And yes. what's your what's your mother tongue? My mother tongue is Hindi. Okay. So, yes. All right. It's it's very interesting. And in terms of um you would have had exposure to all kinds of different um religions and simple ways of life. So when you came to Canada, you came into a program that had a lot of people from, you know, various places and, and you know, a, a large proportion are from India, but uh, we talk about India as being, you know, multiple countries, really, when you, when you kind of think about culture from a Canadian perspective. Um, what was that like for you? Did you kind of come in and go, oh, I know how to work with everybody? Right. Actually, the first thing which really was a highlight as I arrived in the country was the weather because coming in the month of February is not an easy task. <laughs> I think when I arrived, it was minus 12 and I've never been in any place which was that cold in my life. So then navigating myself from Toronto until Kingston with a lot of luggage was a task in itself. But I had a couple of people who helped me come here and they dropped me home. And I've been in Kingston since day one. And I fell in love with the place. It's it's a mix of both, like a big city and a small city. It's not too quiet as a small city is at, but it's not too busy and hectic as big cities are. So it's kind of like a sweet spot for me. Excellent. And minus 12 probably now isn't so bad, is it? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I've seen, so the worst I've seen is minus 35. And that's because of the wind chill. So I never realized how big of a thing windchill was. That was big, the biggest learning curve. Because if you see, it, it's minus two, but it feels like minus 12. So once on my earlier days, I didn't take it as seriously. But once I faced it and I learned from it that you need to wear gloves and caps and protect yourself because of the windchill, I never doubted it. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so let's go back to India now. We're gonna we're going to uh, go to kind of a differing level of degree. So we're gonna change yes. by about what forty degrees Celsius. Yeah, um, so we're gonna go. Yeah. So where I live currently, so my where my parents live currently, it's one of the hotter hotter end of the places in the country. It's in Gujarat. So the highs can go up until forty nine degrees Celsius during summertime. Wow. Yes, wow. That's the, that's the highest you would be able to experience, I would say. And that's where I did my undergraduate in dental surgery. I basically started my education of dentistry in the year of 2015, and I graduated in the year of 2020. So it was right, like almost right after the pandemic started, my graduation was due. And we were doing internship during that time. But with the lockdown and the high amount of cases in India, everything just kind of shut down and we had to just do our uh, rotatory internship in healthcare institutions because as everywhere in the world, the healthcare was the most overburdened sector during this time. And once our internship ended and I got my graduation, I joined one of the private practices in the city itself. So I was part of that private practice from December 2020 till the 2021 of December. So basically I did a full one year tenure in that private practice where I could hone my skills, I learned new things. I had a mentor who would teach me about his own specialization while I was managing his clinic in terms of patient uh, patient interaction as well as in terms of digital media as well. So I do kind of dabble sometimes in digital media such as graphic designing and posting a content on social media platforms. That's what I used to help my mentor with so that we have a social media presence of the private practice he owns. Great. And that's obviously 
um, given you a lot of kind of focus and, and um, I guess maybe direction for what you're doing right now. Um, in terms of some of that work, though, um, when you were in and, and practicing dentistry and, and doing this work on the side, a lot of what you were doing then um, was that administrative managing the clinic type of, of thing. Yes. So part of the reason I have been able to familiarize myself with the administrative background is I learned it in India as well. So doing book work, such as managing the finances of the clinic and using appropriate finances to restock our current materials and make sure you purchase enough so that stuff doesn't expire. Because end of the day, all medical supplies have an expiry date and there are certain conditions which need to be met to take proper care of those materials. If you don't take care of them, they wouldn't be good enough to use it on a patient. So those kind of things. And uh, simply helping my mentor or the senior doctor who was in the clinic and assisting him with patients and with dental procedures, major or minor. So that kind of helped me out with figuring, with getting, I would say, the Figuring out the foundations of an administrative setup in a dental practice or a medical practice in general, that's what it helped me the most with. Okay. And it's interesting because we do have a number of um, people with a BDS who come and study in Canada, um, and often they don't talk about um, those administrative skills that they've gotten um, they tend to get lost in in the the actual procedures that they provided, um, and they don't realize that those skills and those experiences really help with their resume building when they when they get here. Definitely, I agree with you. So these kind of skills are transferable skills and relevant skills in an healthcare administrative program or a career per se. So it's just about how you present yourself to an employer or to the job market in itself so that a right employer can find you. So it works both ways. But it's if you don't project yourself with that kind of expertise which you already have, nobody will know that. You will have to, it's in a way, I will have to say that you'll have to sell yourself, sell your skills. So end of the day, you are being compensated for your skills you provide. Even if it's hourly or your salary, it doesn't matter. All right. Um, and, and that's such great insight. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how your journey came to be that you decided that you wanted to come and study in Canada? What was happening with you at that point? It, I would say it wasn't something I aimed for like way before. I know a lot of people with me had aims to come to Canada way before they even finished the day dental program. In India, but for myself, I think pandemic was one of those key factors which changed my path from pursuing masters in my country to pursuing dentistry in Canada's complete transition. So I am not sure if there was a key instance or moment in my life which influenced that decision, but I would say I did a lot of research on my end along with just exploring because I feel like I'm still young and I would like to experiment and gather as many skills I have. Uh, I'm in a simple way. I didn't want to pursue the traditional route what I had thought in the first. I wanted to try something new, expand my skills, and maybe I can do something else. I find something else I love more than the history. Who knows? All right. So are you closing the door right now on pursuing dentistry? Oh, no, not at all. I have, my doors are open for dentistry anytime. I've already begun the licensing equivalency pro process. So my documents have been verified with the National Board of Dentistry. I am aiming to give my first exam in February of 25. I did plan earlier to give it in August, but I thought delaying it to prepare for my exam would be the best case scenario because I have to save enough finances to prepare for my exam because. I don't know how easy or difficult the exam is, but I do know one thing for sure that it's very financially intensive. So I feel like you need to have enough savings with yourself so that once you start studying, you're not worried in the back of your head that you need to worry about finances and work a job because you can't juggle a lot of things at once. Um, 
Okay. So in terms of you being ready for, for writing that exam, then you're doing some studying and stuff already right now. So the course is very vast, but it's not a lot of ground. You cannot cover that much ground. So there are educational institutions which provide assistance with these kind of things. So I have been able to manage to enroll myself to one of the institutions. The name of the institution is called Prep Doctors. It's an institution that's based in Mississauga, but they have been able to provide with me some educational material for the dental exam. So I am referring to those books and preparing myself right now. All right. So in the interim, you have set yourself up with some fantastic um differing roles that are continuing to expand to your repertoire of skills. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, you came for healthcare administration. Um, what was it about the healthcare administration program that really attracted you? Uh, the first and foremost thing I would say, it's one of the top most programs which makes international med- medical graduates eligible for a program in general, because a lot of programs which are available within the Canadian institutions are more office admin related. So even if you learn office administration, that's an undergraduate program. It's, it's like a certificate program. But healthcare administration is a postgraduate diploma. So that gives you a slight edge over the crowd. That would be my first and foremost point. Secondarily, me being from India, I don't know how healthcare institutions in Canada have operations like. So first of all, I never, even though I knew it was public healthcare system, I never knew there was a thing called health card that everybody needs it to avail those services. Nobody can just step into the door of a clinic and just avail free healthcare. And there are some things which are covered by the uh, provincial programs and some things which are not. So the and those kind of things, which were a great learning curve for me, and other things such as healthcare policies. And if you are outside the country for more than six months, then you'll have to come back and you won't be able to avail the free healthcare. You have to stay in the country for again for some months and then only you will be able to avail the healthcare. Those kind of things and technicalities and other things such as EMR. So, those, the systems and the operations end of all healthcare organizations were very different to my understanding. So everybody needs to learn something or the other so that they are well acquainted when stepping into the job market. Excellent. And while you were here, you've worked in a a few different roles. You've done some volunteering. Um, I know you got here and you were working part-time, like almost immediately. Yes. Uh, do you want to talk about your progression and some of the skills that you got and kind of why you did the various roles that you did? So I would, I would say like I have been blessed and kind of lucky at the same time. So I've, I've known a lot of people that the job market is a little tough in today's state, but arriving into the country within three weeks, I was my first job was at Home Depot. I was a floor sales associate, and to be honest, before I joined Home Depot, I never knew anything about flooring. <laughs> so now I know more about flooring than anything in terms of construction materials right now. So that was my first job. Then I joined Providence Care, uh, thanks to Tim Huddle. Shout out to him. <laughs> so while we were in the healthcare admin program, he appeared in one of our lectures as a guest speaker where we connected and we had a quick chat and we've stayed in touch all through this process back and forth, even though we didn't have anything to specifically talk about, but just to staying in touch with any of the recruiters or your networks often goes a long way when you're, when it comes to time and moment. So I do remember back in May, I would say March of 2022, there was a job fair at Providence Care Hospital and that's where we reconnected and he forwarded my resume to the concerned authorities, and that's how I I cracked the interview. There were three steps within the hiring process, and I finally got a job in Providence Care as a resident support aide. It's one of those COVID positions to aid healthcare organizations such as PSWs and the nursing staff because of the shortage in staff and the overburden of the healthcare facilities during the time of COVID. So that's how I began my healthcare organization journey in Canada. I can say that. And in terms of um, transferable skills, so we're already talking about the fact that you 
a got some fantastic advice on how to do flooring, but you also <laughs> probably got a lot of fantastic advice on how to deal with difficult customers, how yes. to work in the Canadian system and, and kind of some of those things. Um, what did working as, as a, as a, um, an, an aide at, at Providence Care, what did that teach you and what did that give you? And, and were there surprises um, in that role that you found? Uh, I would say the first and foremost was the involvement of ministry into the healthcare organizations it was very surprising to me. They are like very first hand. They can drop into your healthcare facility anytime they please. And they can basically shake up the whole facility if they want to. And they can check ins and outs of everything. Moreover, the attention to detail of uh, resident care, that was very, like I was impressed by it. And the attention detail on the dietary restrictions and the dietary accommodations so that they make sure they had fats, proteins, carbs in each meal and the variety of meals. They had minced food for different residents. They had pureed food. Then they had regular consistency of food. Plus the level of professionalism, the PSWs and the nursing staff exhibits. And I would say overall, it was a well-managed facility, I would say. and. The greatest impressions I've had after joining Providence was one of the clinical educators of the organization. He is retired now. I would like to say his name. His name is Charles Murray. And great person, great personality. I've learned a lot from him. I'm still learning from him. And he is a great mentor, honestly. And I'm thankful to him as well. Moreover, the Bill of Rights. That was the very first and foremost things I learned after joining the healthcare organization in Providence. So I wasn't part of the hospital at King Street. I was part of the long-term care sector. So that's where I started. And after, uh, I would say after working in resident support aid position for six months, there was an internal opening for a part-time scheduler. And that's how I got my first administrative job in Providence. While I was studying, by the way, I was still in the uh, healthcare admin program and I got my job in September or October of 2022 as a part-time schedule of Providence Valley. Let's unpack that a little bit. There's a lot in, in what you had to say there. So you talked about networking initially and, and kind of building that connection with, with the recruiter, Tim. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard Tim Huddle, there is the very first episode actually of this podcast features an interview with him. Um, but he's a fantastic um, person and, and wonderful supporter of um, internationally educated folks. So shout out to Tim. But what you spoke about, you know, really the clinical educator in the long-term care home was huge. And I've heard wonderful things about him as well. Um, in terms of kind of how do you get into that Canadian healthcare environment? Um, there's so much to learn and, and there are so many regulations and things. How do you really develop those relationships and, and what do you need to do kind of as an individual kind of going in for your first few days? Can you talk a little bit about that? Honestly, I think even though as complex as it looks like, it has the most simplest answer, which is just put yourself out there. Make To make connections, you have to take the first step. Nobody will ever know or nobody will, won't even realize that you are looking for some guidance or you are looking for some friends even. So you have to take the first step. Do not hesitate. It. There is nothing bad which can happen. There is no downside of it. That's what I can tell you. It's like one of those things that there's no loss on your end. Either you'll gain something or you'll gain something very small. But in the end, it's your gain only. And part of the reason was keep an open mind in long-term care while doing care of residents or while helping with care of residents, you will see a lot of things which you may not have seen in your country or you may experience a lot of things. So in long-term care, there's all kinds of residents. They will be residents with medical conditions such as dementia, Alzheimer's. They will have violent behavior. Some will be more high-functioning. And the variety of residents you will see in a healthcare se setup, especially in a long-term care home, will make you realize that you can learn a lot. And especially with a high inflow of immigrants into the country, you'll see a lot of PSWs and nursing staff are immigrants as well. Like I've seen a lot of people from India, Philippines, uh, Africa. They are part of the healthcare organization. Most of them are nurses. A lot of them were PSWs. And it's 
it runs all together. Everybody works all well. Everybody teaches each other. You can learn from them and don't hesitate to ask questions. That's great advice. And and oftentimes we kind of get in and, and we're feeling maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome, like I don't really belong here. So we kind of go into our own shells instead of really stepping out and, and kind of, hi, I'm here. I'm new. Can you show me where or can you tell me why? Um, and sometimes when you ask the, that why question, you really get a lot more information. You understand why things get done the way that they do so that, you know, you're making sure that you're doing them the proper way as well. So, Exactly. The use of mechanical lids, the use of slings. These are the things you may or may not have seen. Or the application of such kind of things is different in this country compared to what we have seen in the past in my country. That's what I feel like. So that's my own personal experience, I can say. Excellent. Great. Um, and you also kind of talked a little bit about being able to transfer jobs once you got into that role. So um, you came in really into a kind of a, a breakthrough um probably a part-time temporary role, um, got some experience, and then what happened? So the surprising thing I never knew before I joined scheduling was it was, it's not a profession, it's everybody's first preference, <laughs> especially in the nursing or the healthcare sector, because once I joined in, there was a lot of learning curves, such as moving staff, making sure the resident to staff ratio, that is something I never knew about it and how overtime works, how collective agreements work, how bargaining units do the negotiations, vacation approvals, and so on and so forth. There was a lot to learn, a lot of data to consume at the same time. But thankfully, I had great teachers who taught me well, and I was able to ease in, ease in myself pretty seamlessly through this process. I think it took me two weeks of orientation and training after I was ready to work independently, but a big learning curve, I would say, especially knowing all the rules of the collective agreement, how overtime works and assignment of shift, seniority, rotations, these kind of terminology is something you won't even know if you haven't even joined the healthcare organization in first. And it's one of, and a more bigger thing as a scheduler, you have to look out for is grievances. <laughs> so that's one thing. So it's a great, it was a great place to start where it can be overwhelming for everyone, but I think you need to find your niche when it comes to working. And maybe if you work in situations that other people do not want to work to, it gives you the edge where you can become the first choice for employers. If everybody tries to be an administrative assistant for any organization, they'll see a lot of candidates. In today's day, being an administrative assistant, I'm not saying it's an easy task to do, but it's an easy skill to learn and adapt to. Compared to scheduling, it's not easy, but once you learn it, you get a hang of it. It's very transferable skill, and you can transfer between healthcare to non-healthcare organizations as well. Great, great advice. And it really is a, a, a bit of an analytical because you do have all of those roles and, and rules that you need to um, follow depending on which organization has which collective agreement, what level of, of nursing standard you're looking at all of those different things um so that's that's a big part of it but then again you're also making those call outs to say hey can you come in to cover this shift so probably some learnings there as well particularly at the you know really tired two three years into the pandemic stage right yes i feel like while i was working as a scheduler it kind of but like we have over exhausted our resources than we had already in the first place and all the staff were just burned out. It's the most simplest explanation I can provide. And staff who were in the who showed up for a shift and ended up being shot staff, they were burned out too because they didn't have enough manpower to provide the care to the residents they deserve. And the people who can't show up for the shift were burned out on the other end as well because of working too much or working too much overtime. So you can't blame one or the other way to anyone, somebody either who showed up for work and could not work properly or someone who did not show up for work because they were too burned out because both ends of the spectrum have valid arguments and valid, I would say, circumstances. So you're getting a lot of really great information 
um, that could fuel somebody that wanted to go to work in a policy environment or kind of looking at some of those system improvements in HR and kind of all of those areas. Definitely, definitely. And then once I was part of Providence, then I transitioned to work for a healthcare agency, which provides nursing support to all different kinds of long-term and retirement care organizations. So it was it is Plan A, Kingston, and Quinty. So that was a completely different, like an opposite work environment for me because there were no collectives, no policies per se, because if you work for an agency, it's basically non-unionized environment. You work for an employer and you will be, how do I put this? You will be treated by the Employee Standards Act. So that's when I learned about Employee Standards Act. Because I think bargaining units and collective agreements are based on top of an Employee Standards Act. So they are different, I would say, tunings to it to support different organizations. But when you learn Employee Standards Act, that's a whole different scenario and staffing for instead of one i would say facility i was staffing for 12 facilities now so a whole different dynamic a great workplace to learn multitasking and doing i was also doing data operations a little bit there so what it means was basically depending upon the need of our clients which were healthcare facilities who were requesting staff to compensate for their own short staffing needs we need to project ahead right you can't go by the day in such kind of situation so you need to make sure that you're hiring the right amount of people so that you can support your clients or the healthcare facilities when they are in most need especially before a long weekend comes up a lot of these staff do need time off to spend time with their family and loved ones some people already have made plans and some people can't even come to work due to their personal obligations so you need to make sure all healthcare facilities are staffed properly as part of our service, which that's why we exist, right? Staffing agencies exist to help with the burden of existing healthcare facilities. And did you see a lot of growth in activity while you were there? I know, I know that's been something that um, there's a lot of conversation about kind of provincially. Yes. So I did see a lot of growth in my skill set in terms of the amount of things I was basically able to apply from my, what I learned, have been learning from the program. So part of what I do remember, one of the subjects while I was in the healthcare admin program was healthcare operations. So basically using that kind of learnings from our professors and a, a application of that into real world was something, a big learning curve. It is a different thing when you learn something in a class and using that kind of knowledge, applic- app, applying that to a real world is a completely different scenario because the things you learn are not in the same conditions the things you apply for, right? So even though my duration at Plan A wasn't long enough as I have been associated with Providence, but it was a good learning curve for me. Okay, good. Good. And what was the next step for you then? So the next step was Ongwanada. I am still associated with Ongwanada, but I joined Ongwanada as a scheduler. Now Ongwanada, I'm back in unionized environment, but now the staff count goes above 450. We have three different collective agreements while staffing for, I think, 25 different homes. So they don't have proper, it's not like a big building like Providence. They have small, it's like a home care facility, but we supply staff to those homes for clients, which are part of Ongwanawana. So a whole different dynamic. It was much less automated than the other healthcare organizations have been in because of the three different collectives. So no software can really accommodate that kind of dynamics, right? So it's too burdening on the software as well. So we had to get it down to a pen and paper and write everything down, make sure we made a note. And overtime applications are different for different collective agreements. Shift offers are different for different collective agreements. So you need to make sure you are very thorough when you're calling out shifts because it doesn't take a long time when people grieve it and you have to pay them out or the organization has to pay them out. End of the day, you want to make sure that all the homes are staffed adequately as for the needs. Secondly, you make sure that the finances are well kept into the well kept interest of the organization. Right. And you were balancing at Anguanada. Um, you provide support for people with um, developmental disabilities. So there were two different ministries. So you're looking at the Ministry of Social Services as well as the Ministry of Health. 
um, yes. probably in terms of some of the, the differing um, collective agreements yeah. that you were dealing with. Okay. Exactly. So you could probably be like a union um, <laughs> expert right now, and, and we could yes. probably do an entire podcast <laughs> on do I work in a unionized environment or not? No, um, exactly. So the, <laughs> I know I have known the collective agreements of QP. I know collective of OPSU. I know, so I know there's another collective called Luna, which is an American collective agreement bargaining unit. So it's a lot of, I would say, intricacies going around in different environments. So it is an interesting thing how different collective agreements work. All right. So we we know that that um, obviously the staffing role is a really critical one, um, and you're still kind of providing some casual support uh, yes. to Anguinada. Um, but you've really gotten into that emergency scheduling piece with your latest role. So yes. can you talk a little bit about that and, and what kind of was that oh, factor um, when <laughs> so, you said, I want to do this job? Yeah. So, so in my, my commitment with Onguanada was a permanent part-time scheduler, but they gave me a full-time hours because I was in a temporary full-time line, but I do wanted something. I wanted to, I would say, drift away from the healthcare part of it like be associated with the healthcare part of it but now i need a change of dynamics because it's the same thing i've been doing even though i'm learning so much but in terms of applying it, it not it's just not something which is really new for me it's the same collective agreements i need to follow it's the same calling out of shifts i need to follow i need i needed more responsibilities and more i would say tasks on my shoulders because i felt like i can go to the next step i have those skills so that's where County of Frontenac came in. So basically, um, County of Frontenac is a big organization part of the government, and it has like con Cataraki Conservation Reserve, it has Frontenac Paramedics, and so on and so forth. I'm just a part of Frontenac Paramedical Services, and it's like completely frontline associated with the mayor, government, and those kind of authorities come into play, while also keeping in mind of the collective agreement, which is up to you. So now dealing with the primary care and advanced care paramedics is a totally change of dynamics. I didn't expect it that it would be so much of a learning curve for me because now, now the EMR has changed because different organizations have different scheduling software. So you have to learn the new software. And in this time, I'm not just staffing the paramedics. I'm basically coordinating all the staff, such as vacation approvals and other kind of responsibilities, making sure people who are on long-term disabilities or on workplace injuries, taking that into consideration, making sure I'm in loop with the payroll end of it because I have to make sure all of my staff gets paid on time. I have to make sure all the codings of their work sh working shifts are proper. So basically, I'm taking more responsibilities. I'm well compensated financially or before it so and along the way we are now transitioning into a new software so now i am learning the new software while also building up for it for the organization so again i'm learning something new and it's been great so far i've just i just finished my probation four days ago <laughs> congratulations so, yes thank you <laughs> so and a, and the paramedics um in frontenac are responsible for really a, a huge section of the 401 and, um, you know, larger urban centers as well as, you know, rural areas. And also there's an awful lot of prisons here um, yes. in this region. So there's, there's lots of special things that um, happening and, and I'm sure that that learning curve, you know, is, is huge as well um, just from yes. the, the, the type of, of service that's provided. Yes, completely. So the rotations paramedics works is different. The way they they operate is different. So example, they are different bases depending upon the geographical location. Because County of Frontenac, it's not just Kingston, right? It's going from Kingston, I think it's until Robertsville. So pretty north up there. So it covers quite some land ground, including the 401. And sometimes you have to coordinate with dispatch, which is... Basically, when you call the 911 service, you don't call Frontenac paramedics. You call the dispatch who keeps contact with Frontenac paramedics and lets the trucks know where they want to report and who they report to. So all kinds of different things come into play when you're working with. And plus now I have to 
oriented people, the paramedics, about our scheduling policies, our collective agreements, how it works, how they are expected to work around the organization's policies and those kind of things. Like now I'm basically teaching what I know best <laughs> so that I can uh, help the organization. So it's a great part. I'm loving it so far. Excellent. And you are that lifelong learner. So <laughs> it seems, you know, that the, the thing that you had when you were younger and that you only stayed in one place for so long yes. and had to move in, we, we've at least got you secured in Kingston, um, yes. but you are still like, I, I need to learn more and I need to do more. Um, and that's absolutely fantastic. And, and the skills that you're using, um, you know, they're, they are very different, despite the fact that you might have had the same title. Yes. Um, and I think that's something to look at, too, when we're looking at job descriptions and when we're thinking about what possibly could I do? Um, is this is this a role that, you know, you could see, you know, somebody who's looking for an admin role um, just doing scheduling, you know, and, and I shouldn't say just doing scheduling, um, being the amazing scheduler, <laughs> being the schedule guru, like there's room yes. to move around within the system as well. Definitely. Like, in my opinion, like, if you are looking for an administrative position, scheduling can be a great place to start at. It can be a great learning curve for sure, but it's not impossible. It's not, like, undoable. You can just, you just have to have a knack for it, I would say. It, it is something everybody can do, but it, not everybody can be good at it. You need to and have a knack when for When you're it. done work, yes. when, when, when you finish your shift, and you walk away, are you able to leave it there? Or I, I'm just thinking because you're going to be studying, well, you are studying yes. now. Um, is it a is it a role you mentioned that you're you're compensated well for yes. it? Um, is it a role that you can kind of leave behind while you're not there and then pick it up easy the next time you show up? Not at all. So part of the reason scheduling is something which happens 24-7, right? Uh, even though if I take time off, there needs to be a backup scheduler to make sure everything is well in place. So like I said, like it's not something which is easily replaceable, I can say. like In the coming area, we always think like AI or technology can replace everything. But it, I don't think scheduling is a replaceable skill. It can be eased with the help of softwares and technology. But I think the mental aspect of it and the creativity of it helps it a job profession which will be irreplaceable in the coming time it cannot be like lost in technology i would say okay so how do you manage everything that's on your plate with preparing for licensure um with what you're doing honestly i think you need to multitask a little bit plan your day ahead make sure you have room for studying as long as some life as well you can't just work and study Monday to Sunday, seven days a week. You need to keep your mind fresh. You need to keep your mind stimulated. And summer is here, so you, you can go around, have a walk, go kayaking. Kingston is a lovely place to kayak. So, basically, right, so you're doing a lot of that self-care and, and kind yeah, of... You need to. Right. You need to do that to keep your mind fresh and keep yourself on track. Otherwise, you'll just be... You're not a robot. You're human. <laughs> Excellent. And how are the things that you're learning right now setting you up for your future? That's a great question. I think down the road, even though I'm in a great place right now, financially and my professional life, I think these kind of occupations and experiences which I've had until this point will help me grow further into the administrative ladder. That's something I'm really looking forward to at the same time while I'm preparing for my examination. But I'm not, I don't hate my job. I, I like doing what I do. So why not grow at what I do, like what I like at? I would love to see that there would be a role for me which I can be good at, which is not scheduling as well. So I'm open for those kind of branching out job roles as well. Because end of the day, scheduling is a completely different aspect of every organization, but I feel like there are other administrative roles, such as policy making, such as performance standards. Even these kind of roles, even though they are not entry level, but if you have enough administrative experience, you can get into it. You can't aim for it first go right after graduation, but if you get enough experience, if you get enough skills for that, 
there's I don't see there would be a barrier stopping you to get that role. Excellent. And you're certainly making the connections and yes. um, people are seeing you and, and seeing how well you adapt and develop your skills and continue to reach out. Um, do you have any go-to places for, for learning right now? Do you, um, you know, do you still go and visit LinkedIn learning or Coursera or any of those uh, places? Or are you right? I, right now I'm trying to look at the project management side of healthcare which is really something blooming right now because now we have overburdened healthcare facilities in Canada. So how do you make that, like, correct that? You make more healthcare facilities. Then if you need more healthcare facilities, you need project managers to help with those healthcare facilities. And so I think that is one of those booming sectors which would be really helpful and that might require some proprietary skills which you need to learn. You don't, you won't be able to get that through experience. From experience, you can get that discipline and that kind of quick grasping skill, but you need to learn something. So I think project management is the next step. Project management certainly is one of those things that I see on a lot of um, managerial job yes. postings. And, and it really is, you know, if you're bringing something new in, it, you kind of look at change in healthcare and all change is really a project that's being implemented. So when you look at those skills, they are, you know, very adaptable as well across industries. Um, there are a lot of people that take that Coursera course um, mm -hmm. in project management. And then once they get some on the ground experience, will apply for their, their PMI licensure. Yes. Um, Agile project management is another um, big component. And, and it seems to be one that, that a lot of folks look at as well, if you're not looking at being in a formal project management office. And again, technology is really driving a lot of projects as well. So huge, huge skills to have and ones that will really put you in good yes. standing. Um, okay, this is interesting. You have so many places that you could go. So what we need to do is come back to you in another year and say, all right, what are you doing now? Um, I know, true. I know you, you want to establish roots where you're at. So it may, may, not, yeah. may not be fair to say a year, <laughs> but you know, maybe in two years. Sure, definitely. I'm always open for more conversations like these. Excellent. Um, and in terms of the skills that you've used that you picked up in school over the years, yes. you're using a lot of them now, aren't you? Yes. I feel like if you think like what you learn over the course of two years in the program, you think like you may have not learned a lot to apply for, but it's not until you get into a field job or a, or in any job, you you will see certain scenarios where you think like, right, I learned this, I know about this, or I heard about this. So maybe if you don't know 100% of it, I think knowing 20% of it or 30% of it is a good enough progress because you know 30% more than the rest of the crowd. So that's what gives you the edge. Excellent. Yeah. And that, that is uh, something that we hear a lot too, kind of in the education world. It's like, yes. why am I learning this? I'm never going to. And it's like, yeah, you will. <laughs> you know, if you, if you want to work in this, you'll need to, you know, have an understanding of this and it may not make sense right now. And, and, you know, the system doesn't make sense to you kind of when you're, when you're first starting out. Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to you after you've had a career in it though. either. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I need to be careful. I, I, uh, yeah, I do get myself in trouble. So how do you stay motivated, Amode? I, I don't know, actually, how do I stay motivated? I think part of the reason is maybe you need to have a bigger goal in life. You need to have, for example, my bigger goal in life is right now dentistry. So that's what keeps you motivated because you need to have something to look forward to end of the day, even though you don't have a specific timeline, but you need something to wake up in the morning and go to a work and say, like, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. So you need to work towards that. If you don't have something to look forward to, I don't think you would be motivated enough, enough to show up for your work, even though if it's a sales associate position at Home Depot. So I think you need to have a knack for something, number one. Number two would be something, a goal in life. It doesn't have to be dentistry. It's not for everyone. It's maybe people have been dentists in India and they don't want to pursue it anymore because they didn't like it when they were studying. But that's fine. It's part of life. You do something and you don't like it. That's how you know you don't like it. Like It's part of, it's part of the process. So I think just 
just look forward, try as many things as you can, learn as many things as you want, and you'll find something you like and you'll work for it. Excellent. Um, great advice, by the way. And when you were kind of going along your path and, and meeting people, were you really targeted that this is an area I want to go? Or were you just open to let's test and, and try this out? You, you've got your pathway to, to writing the dental exam. Yes. That's kind of your main path, but you've, you've just kind of done these little branches. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just branching out right now, even right like today's date, if somebody tells me I have this part-time position open, and it is not something I know about, it is not something I've learned about, but if I get the opportunity, I'll take it. That's how I know if I like it, if I don't. So just brown, like I would say just widen your skill set, open your eyes. And in Canada, there is a lot more in terms of your professional career, like People see your education qualification first, for sure. But the person who is at the other end of your table as the, who you're interviewing also matters more. It matters more than your education, I would say. All right. So those personal connections are big. Yes, personal connections. And you, you should be, I would say, even if you have a knowledge for it, I think you need to be a people person. Even if it's sales, even if it's like policy making, like you're not going to make policies inside a board or office. You will have to talk to people. You have to make yourself heard. You have to hear other people as well. So it's all about interaction with different organizations and individuals all along the way of your career. Excellent. And we've had wonderful discussion about um, the the incredible things that you've learned already kind of in your career in Canada, you haven't been here that long. Um, no, so... It's just, you know, it's amazing how much you can learn and how quickly. <laughs> exactly. So it's been two years and I would say three months. Wow. Yes. Um, so are you still looking at PR? Is that something that's still? Uh, it is in the back of my head, but not my topmost priority on the list of to-do things. I have my work permit till 26. As I said, I'm trying to learn as much as I can. I'm trying to be more financially stable and in terms of stable, not being more compensation, but in terms of stability is something like if I have to study for the next six months, I have enough in my savings so that I can study like basically tension free. Perfect. And PR will just kind of fall PR into place. For, exactly. Yeah. So it's part yeah. of the process. It's not something I'm aiming for first and foremost thing. I love that perspective. Oftentimes people graduate and it's like, okay, next thing PR. Yes. And, you know, it's just every every decision is made around getting that PR. Whereas if you're working in healthcare, you're going to you're going to end up having those hours anyhow, you'll be fine. Exactly. In the end, I know if even if you have PR, it's not like you have the skills. So PR yeah. doesn't guarantee anything in the end of the life. It just guarantees your presidency, like your status in the country. But it doesn't guarantee anything like your skills, like your compensation, like your stability. Everything else comes from your own experiences. Your ability to live a life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Excellent. Um, um, what would you say to Young Emote if you were just coming here now? Uh, what advice would you have for yourself? Oh, Young Emote. Okay. I just let him know, be patient and keep an open mind all right pretty simple but i think it's gonna help a long way okay is there anything else that we haven't covered that you want to oh uh, i don't think so i think i've had all the knowledge i can impart today <laughs> all right yes. and if any of our listeners wanted to reach out to you would you be open to them linking up with you on linkedin yes, is that definitely the primary yeah very active on LinkedIn. I will, if you want my email address, I will drop in in my LinkedIn as well. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions, queries, concerns, even if you want any kind of guidance. If it's under my own like life expertise or knowledge, I would love to help you out. If I don't know about it, I would love to help you connect to the people who can help you for that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amod. You are such an incredible um learner and obviously somebody who 
has goals and yet an openness to explore and learn more kind of about what's around you. And I'm really excited to watch what the next 10 years holds for you, because I think there's some really incredible things in there. So Definitely. thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Professor Julie. It's always a delight to have a talk with you. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope the information shared today helps you in your journey. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Crossing Borders on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're so inclined, rate this show or provide feedback in the comments. You can always find more information at profjulie.ca.